And then finally, subsection D states, nothing in this section shall be construed to limit the rights, procedures, and remedies available under any law, including the Vermont Administrative Procedure Act. So that's the language in the bill. Are there any questions about that before I move on to talk about existing remedies separate from the language in the bill? Um, great. So actually, I was just going to ask you about D that you just last went to, and it sounds like that's where you're going next. No, right. I'm going to talk about uh, existing causes of action under existing law separate from the language in the bill, but we will definitely talk about D at the end. What it basically says is this adds to the existing remedies. It's another vehicle or another tool, but all other vehicles or tools under existing law are still available to a party. Okay. Um, when we, we looked at cause of action in this committee several years ago as part of the clean water work, and um, can you remind us in what ways this is like or not like um, federal environmental legislation like Clean Air, Clean Water Act, Endangered Species Act, which as, I, as I'm recollecting, all included a right of a cause of action um, so that interested persons could, in essence, require the federal government to act in fulfillment of the uh, intent of the law. Is this pretty much the same or are there distinctions what's being constructed here compared to the federal version of that? So federal version I'm not familiar with and I'm sorry okay. I can't answer those questions. But remember, as we talked about last week, this is a state law. So yep. those federal uh, laws or vehicles uh, procedures do not apply. We will talk about state cause of action that exists currently. And as you'll see, there's quite a bit of overlap between the existing state uh, cause of action and the language in this bill. Okay. And then just a basic question. Um, the, it seems as though the remedy is sending it back to the agency to uh, write, basically try again on, on rules. Is that the <clears throat> normal remedy in such cases? I mean, for I'll just I can imagine someone coming up with an alternative that would say, since your rules were in a not effective, we're going to ask someone else to write the rules. I don't know who a more suitable party would be, but um, so is it always constructed this way? You send it back to the originating agency to um, uh, try again. Well, as you'll see in a moment under existing causes of action, I think that is usually the remedy. I am not familiar with a court sending it to a completely different agency or department. I don't see how that would work. Sure. Um, if you remember, as we talked about last week, uh, there's no inferred apparent uh, authority to engage in rulemaking under Vermont law. So every agency and department has to be given that authority. So in this bill, a &R is given the authority to promulgate rules to implement the act. I don't see how a court could ask a completely different agency or department to assume that authority. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other committee questions before we go on? All right, thank you. Thank you. So these are remedies under current law. I'm not gonna spend time on the first two, but I want you to be aware of them. There's been questions about, well, how do you influence or have a role in the process? Obviously in a rulemaking process, there's extensive public outreach. And remember under this bill, not only is there a rulemaking process, but ANR has to update those rules periodically. So the first uh, ability to participate or influence the rules is to participate in that process. Secondly, under 3 VSA 806, any person, and remember person could be an individual or a legal entity or an organization, may submit a written request that an agency adopt, amend, or repeal a rule, and the agency within 30 days must do so or deny that request in writing. So these are two tools that exist under current law. I do not intend to spend time discussing them. I wanna focus under an action pursuant to rule 75, and then most important, perhaps an action pursuant to 3 VSA 807. This is a screenshot of parts of rule 75. I won't read the whole 
rule to you. I've highlighted the most important aspects of it. This really concerns what I call scenario A, where a &R has simply refused or declined to engage in the rulemaking process. It is similar to what is sometimes called a writ of mandamus. It is an action to force an agency or department or governmental official to carry out a duty that they're supposed to do under law. That's really what this concerns. And you'll see the highlighted text states that this is for uh, any action or failure or refusal to act by an agency of the state. You'll see under B, there's language concerning how that action is commenced and what it must include. Under C, you'll see the time limits, and we'll talk about that in a moment. They're a little different than what's in the bill. And then D, there's language about what the remedy might be. And I let me minimize my screen here. The judgment of the court shall affirm, reverse, or modify the decision under review as provided by law. And under E, there's a right to appeal. So this is a rule of civil procedure that confers under existing law any person the authority to go to court to challenge a failure or refusal to act by an agency or department. This is what folks call Rule 75 action. So this would be available to anyone regardless of whether this language is in the bill or not. And I'll talk about what's different between the two in a moment. Are there any questions about a Rule 75 action? Uh, yeah, I, I haven't seen, I've heard of uh, this one before, but not familiar with, you know, I haven't followed any stories where someone said this has been filed. Is this, when you were doing your work on this issue, do you come across recent cases or are, are these common or rare? I don't know the answer for that. I did not research that question. Once again, this is similar to a writ of mandamus. So it would be a refusal of an entity to carry out a lawful duty. I don't know how common that has been. Okay. Um, and when it says action or failure, so refusal sounds pretty straightforward. like someone has not done something, but if they wrote a rule or operated uh, an agency in such a manner as to fail to maintain, for instance, water quality, does, is that sufficient then to bring an action under Rule 75? I think such an action would probably be better brought under the provision of law we're about to talk about, okay. which would be when they take action, but it's insufficient to achieve uh, the goal set forth in law. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from committee members? The next cause of action is under 3 VSA 807, and this might be the cause of action that would more likely to be brought. Uh, this would be an action for declaratory judgment on the validity or applicability of a rule. And the pertinent part of the statute states the validity or applicability of a rule may be determined in an action for declaratory judgment in the Washington Superior Court if it is alleged that the rule or its application interferes with or impairs or threatens to interfere with or impair the legal rights or privileges of the plaintiff. Now, there's different grounds that you can proceed under 3 VSA 807 for declaratory judgment. They include that the rule exceeds a legislative grant of authority, that the agency or department wasn't conferred authority to engage in this rulemaking or issue this rule, that the rule is contrary to legislative intent, and most important, that it is arbitrary, unreasonable, or contrary to law. And Senator Bray, you mentioned earlier federal law under federal uh, law pertaining to challenging rules there are sometimes similar concepts. I think they're expressed a little differently. So we're just gonna focus under state precedent, but there are some similarities. This, if a &R engages in rulemaking and they do issue rules and they're applied, but they're not achieving sufficient greenhouse gas reductions, this might be the cause of action that somehow the rules were either 
arbitrary or unreasonable or fail to achieve sufficient reductions. Now, I want to talk about what arbitrary is defined to mean, but before I do that, are there any questions? Sure. I'm just trying to, if in a certain way we're talking about insufficiency um, of the either the, the rules or their implementation. So I, I guess I want to keep two, those two threads in mind as we work through it. You could write good rules but fail to regulate, or you could write weak rules that weren't going to achieve those goals anyway, um, and you might regulate great. Um, so are, are both those situations captured by uh, 3VSA 807? Yes, I believe so. Okay. So the arbitrary is defined in statute in 3VSA 801, subdivision 13, as meaning there's no factual basis for the decision by the agency. Uh, the decision made by the agency is not rationally connected to the factual basis asserted, or the decision made by the agency would not make sense to a reasonable person. And in addition, this statutory definition of the term cross-references to Vermont Supreme Court decisions. One of those is called Byers and the other is called NRE Town of Sherborne. Now, in the Sherborne decision, there is some language that I wanna to read to you. The Vermont Supreme Court stated that in assessing the validity or arbitrariness or reasonableness of a challenged rule, the court says, we must decide whether the decision or rule makes sense to a reasonable person even if the reviewing court might have weighed the factors differently. The agency or department that's making a rule has wide discretion over what way to give criteria or factors or what conclusions to draw. And even if the record underlying the rule or decision contains conflicting evidence, the board's findings or decisions or the department or agency's findings or decisions will ordinarily be upheld. And in the buyer's court, the Vermont Supreme Court stated, the court will not substitute its judgment for that of the rule making body. So this is a very deferential standard of review. Uh, what would be held to be perhaps unreasonable or arbitrary, it's a tough burden to meet. And therefore, if NR does engage in rulemaking and is making a good faith effort to satisfy the requirements of the law, it is not an easy matter to go to court and have the court declare that that rulemaking is either arbitrary or unreasonable or insufficient. What might happen is that in a complex proceeding, especially something pertaining to greenhouse gas emissions, it becomes a uh, battle of experts and really a battle of data and it's different interpretation. And if you remember, there's a requirement in the bill that ANR not only engage in rulemaking, but also develop a detailed factual record about the basis for its rules, the basis for its conclusions, the basis for its decisions, and that it file that with the proposed rules when it begins a rulemaking process. So Luke, in this case, you're saying, um... What we're trying to determine here is if, again, ANR were to go through the rulemaking process um, based on the legislation, their rules would not necessarily be able to, or they could be challenged, but that the courts would um, basically permit or allow, likely to allow those rules to be upheld. Yes, I, I would phrase it a little differently, but basically Please. I think we're saying the same thing. I, I talked about a deferential standard of review. Okay. So every case is distinct. The court should always look at the facts, the applicable law, reach a decision. Every case would be different. It's hard to predict, but it is a deferential standard of review. Now, remember in the bill, the rules that ANR is required to develop must achieve those mandatory greenhouse gas emissions reductions targets. Mm -hmm. They have to, they have to do it. Right. And so there is, there is something very concrete at the end of the day 
that the court has to look at and see if those rules are achieving that or it's reasonable to think they will achieve it or not. So on one hand, that's very concrete. On the other hand, though, the courts have a very deferential approach to rulemaking in general, and they give a lot of deference to the agency or department that's engaging in the process. Thank you. And if I could just uh, also, so again, just to, to kind of go back to the big picture, we keep talking about a legislative check-in, possibly, or there seemed to, at least during our last meeting, some concern that there wasn't kind of a legislative check-in. But as as you're, you were speaking, I was thinking to myself, okay, well, if the ultimate goal, of course, is to reduce greenhouse gases emissions, and we are directing somebody to do that, uh, and as you say, that is the goal. They have to reduce those emissions. Um, I guess I need to go back, and maybe I'm asking the chair and others, where were we thinking that a check-in with the legislature would be perhaps warranted? Were you asking about the bill or more generally? No, well, the bill. Last time we were in this discussion as a committee, we were talking about the need perhaps for a legislative check-in. And I'm just looking actually to the chair as a reminder, were we thinking that folks might check in around how they are going to actually reduce the greenhouse gases? You know, in terms of the processes that they might take to do that? Um, so I think there were two places we were looking at um, sort of pivot points. One is there's a plan crafted by a council that then gets um, delivered to ANR to, as the basis for rulemaking. Um, and I think the, one of the questions we looked at was to what degree should the direction actually come from the legislature uh, as opposed to from the council. So we talked about uh, without getting stuck in the words exactly, uh, you know, sure. would the legislature perhaps ratify a plan that came out of a council mm -hmm. and then they would become a legislative mandate for rulemaking as opposed to sort of a council mandate for rulemaking. That'd be a check-in point. Um, then we looked at, well, when rules came out, would you ever have the legislature checking back in again? And I think, um, you know, well, Mr. Martin can remind us of how he phrased it, but I think, you know, especially from work on LCAR, by the time we've asked for rules to be written, um, we only have that handful of tests, you know, the reasonable, uh, the, are they arbitrary, the contrary to law, beyond grant of authority, contrary to legislative intent. So they have a, any rulemaking entity has a fair amount of scope. I wouldn't want to uh, sort of abridge the, personally, the administrative procedures act, which works well as long as we've given adequate direction at the outset, I think, you know, that yep. to me is the key part. And that's sort of where I, I'm looping back in. Senator McDonald had some thoughts on this as well. Please. Um, Mr. Chair, on the, the first scenario that I was concerned about was when the council met and convened, um, it never produced a plan or didn't convene and never produced a plan, at which point the bill allows the uh, administration to, to put forth rules, um, period. Um, I stated uh, my belief that if the council puts together a plan that gives the, um, the legislatures and the legislators an opportunity to you know, take a look at that plan and sit and do nothing or to introduce a bill to um, thwart or um, modify the plan. That's, that's just the nature of things. I was worried about the administration putting forth a plan in the absence, uh, uh, excuse me, the administration putting forth rules in the absence of a duly elected plan. 
That was my concern. Okay. Thank you. Thank you both. That's again, I know it's a bit of a 30,000 uh, foot look back or, or look down on this situation, but that was helpful. Thank you. My, my remedy would be that a sentence somewhere said in the when the, the secretary administration fails to call the council to meet, there be a alternative way of the council to meet by a majority of the council members um, saying, we shall meet. Senator McDonald, have you worked at all with um, Mr. Martinland to get, draft any language to that effect, sort of the make sure the council meets provision? I had not uh, worked with Mr. Martland on that till about 22 seconds ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we like fresh work. <laughs> okay. Nothing stale. All right. So, great. Thank so you. let's, um, if you are working with him to get some language together, I mean, I think we may start collecting fragments and then uh, I'd like to create some sort of container to collect the ideas that uh, come out of our discussions. We're gonna have a lot more discussion in the balance of this week with some of our witnesses about this whole process um, tomorrow. And uh, Thursday, Friday, we have uh, roughly 10, 12 witnesses uh, and a number of whom will be helping us learn about different ways to look at that process. Um, uh, models from elsewhere. For instance, if we have um, Professor Cash with us from Massachusetts, I think he was involved in the Massachusetts version. So uh, we'll have other models to look at as we think about looking for opportunities to make improvements. Um, Mr. Rantling, can I go back to the, well, so I don't want to change topics on us. Is there any other section in law or elsewhere that you want to bring to our attention in terms of other ways of um, looking for a remedy for it should the state not achieve what would be mandatory climate greenhouse gas reduction goals? No, but I wanted to do is now pull these threads together. So we've reviewed what's in the bill. Yep. I've given you an overview of what's in existing law separate from the bill. I wanted to try to pull the threads together and compare the two so it's clear what's different and what's similar. Great. Would you want me to proceed with that or did you have another question? Uh, I think that, that would be very helpful, thank you. Okay, so once again, we've looked at the language in the bill. We read through that at the beginning. We've now looked at uh, remedies in current law separate from what's in the bill. So here's what's similar and different between the two. If you look at what I call scenario A, where ANR simply refused to engage in rulemaking, that's similar to the Rule 75 option in current law. You'll notice that the bill specifically refers to Rule 75 for the procedures. The timeframes are a little different. So that is a difference between the two. The bill gives a longer period to bring an action under subsection A. In addition, in the bill, unlike under Rule 75, there's the notice provision that a plaintiff has to give notice to a &R before proceeding. In scenario B, once again, that's when a &R has engaged in rulemaking, but the rules are not reducing greenhouse gas emissions sufficiently. That would perhaps be similar to an action under 3 VSA 807. The timeframes are a little different once again. And under B, perhaps it's more limited than under 3 VSA 807, because you remember in the bill, it requires that uh, the rules be a substantial cause of the failure to meet the greenhouse gas emissions reductions requirements. And if ANR is making prompt and effective action to remedy that situation, they may be given an extension to do so. Now, there have been some questions, particularly in the House. Well, if you already have existing remedies and there's some differences as to timeframes, do you really need this language or what's truly different about it? So under any scenario, if you're proceeding under existing law, Rule 75 or the existing statute, if you were proceeding under this bill, you always have to have standing 
you always have to show that you suffered some sort of harm. Um, you could proceed under the language in the bill. You could also proceed under existing law. Maybe you can make the argument, therefore, they aren't all necessary. But including the language in the bill certainly makes it very clear that there are these remedies and removes any doubt as to a potential cause of action, what must be shown, and how a person would need to proceed. So it provides certainty in that regard. Now, the language in D, as you indicated earlier, uh, Senator Bray, that makes clear that the current remedies are still available. So really what you end up with, if you were to proceed with this bill and the language as written, is any potential plaintiff has a menu of options. And as you know, often there's multiple causes of action alleged or alternative pleadings. So it could be that an individual proceeds under Rule 75 or 807, what's most applicable, and under this bill and could plead in the alternative. So really what this does is it has some slight differences with current law, but plaintiffs would have a menu of different options as to how best to decide to proceed. Are there any questions? Yes, please. Um, so in how difficult is it to, uh, for a person to establish standing in a particularized harm? For instance, do I need to demonstrate that I have um, asthma and that condition is exacerbated by uh, air quality issues? Or can I simply say that um, having a sustainable climate uh, is, is a desirable thing for all of us. Therefore, I, I'm, there's the harm is that I'm that climate is changing, and it's because uh, we haven't addressed, we haven't reduced the rate of damaging climate change. I think it's more the latter as opposed to the former, but that is a question you should definitely ask. Um, I've never litigated in this field in Vermont, so that's something you should ask the Attorney General's office. Some of your other witnesses, I think, have brought causes of action. I think they could answer that better um, as to exactly what level of harm you would need to establish. Okay. Um, another quick question is, um, in the language, it says, if the court finds that the rules adopted by the secretary pursuant to Section 593 of this chapter are a substantial cause of failure to achieve the greenhouse gas reduction requirements. Um, how literal is that uh, reading of rules? Because there's, there's, we've gone back and forth. We said, you need a good set of rules. You also need a good implementation of those rules. Um, so when, they, when the word rules is used there, does that mean not wrote adequate rules, but they were also adequately implemented and enforced? Well, it, it could mean a little of both. And so if you write a great set of rules, but you simply don't enforce, enforce them at all, then that might be also um, under the writ of mandamus, under Rule 75, you're failing to carry out a legal duty. So that's what I meant by there might be uh, multiple causes of action or uh, multiple pleading. So if there are great set of rules, but the agency has never applied them or enforced them, that might also be the mandamus action. Okay. So a party might allege different things. All right. What makes me nervous when you use the word you know, never. So I don't know if it's as black and white as yeah. no rules or great rules, but they're not enforced. It, it might be uh, alternative pleadings or uh, real disagreement between experts about how good the rules were or how they could or should have been enforced. Okay, and one other, um, just a phrase here, a little further down in sub C that follows where I was just reading from. It says that a uh, plaintiff shall be awarded reasonable costs and attorney's fees unless doing so would not serve the justice. So what does that phrase mean, would not serve the interests of justice? Well, thank you for bringing that up. In C, there's a number of phrases such as substantially prevailing party. Uh, the phrase you just looked at would not serve the interest of justice. 
all of these are taken from uh, other statutes. So it's terminology that should be known and familiar to the courts. So as to would not serve the interests of justice, this phrase is actually used in multiple other statutes. It's something that should be familiar to the court. I think it's hard to define and it's intentionally not a defined phrase, but it's something that gives the court discretion if they really think that the awarding of costs or fees would be um, contrary to the interest of justice somehow uh, inappropriate or not appropriate or not fair, they would have the ability not to do so. Okay, all right. Um, any other committee questions for Mr. Martland on the cause of action and other remedies? Great. Well, Great, thank, thank you for, very much. Thank you very much for uh, walking. And um, is that presentation also posted to our website? Yes, it is. Okay, great, thanks. And with that, um, then we'll move over to, I don't see, uh, Ms. O'Toole, are you, I don't see um, Mr. Walk, there he is, uh, Commissioner Walk. So I don't know who's the speaker today or your tag team wrestling. You're welcome, of course, to always uh, both join in if you wanna do the presentation together or one or the other. Sure. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Peter Walk, uh, Commissioner of the Department of Environmental Conservation. Um, I'm joined by Megan O'Toole, who is our lead attorney on all air quality matters. Um, I will provide the overview of, of our testimony and then ask uh, Megan where my legal knowledge falls short uh, to assist or, or where I might otherwise get myself in trouble from being a lay person. Um, so thank you to the committee for having us here. Uh, the, I, I speak largely on, but well, I should say largely, I speak on behalf of the administration here as, as, as A&R has been the lead in pulling together testimony from various uh, agencies of state government. Obviously this is a challenge and a problem that affects all state agencies and we all have a role to play that is reflective of the membership of the council and, uh, and the work that we're, that we're trying to accomplish together. Um, there are many different parts and pieces that will come into play as we think about where our emissions come from, how we're going to address them, and then in particular thinking about the resilience factor and how do we prepare for a climate that has already changed and will continue to do so regardless of whether or not we limit our emissions. Um, so I want to start there. I want to, I want to uh, first and foremost say in terms of the intent of this bill, uh, we have worked with the House since the beginning of the session and in fact before the end of the session to try to, uh, to, to, to work together on this bill. The, I think that the intent, which is to create a plan and a structure for Vermont to reduce our emissions is one we are supportive of. Um, we have worked uh, in our role uh, as collaborating with um, other states around the region and around the country. We've, we've had many conversations along the way about other states that have, with other states that have pursued similar approaches and tried to understand and learn from uh, their work um, and to understand what the differences have been and what's been effective and what's not. There are uh, a number of these uh, a very similar uh, bills that have passed in recent years in states such as Maine and New York. Uh, Massachusetts was the first, uh, Massachusetts and California being first, but, the, but uh, Connecticut has a very similar law to Massachusetts as well. I'm just trying to understand what has been effective, what, where states have struggled, uh, et cetera. Um, the, the council model is something that uh, New York and Maine both bring into their approaches, but their, um, their, their councils are, uh, I would say too large to be effective. Um, they, but climate change obviously affects many different sectors of our state and our economy. 
but uh, we still have to have an effective organization in order to function. Um, and so we have to make sure that there's a balance there. Um, so what we what we did over the course of, of the first half of the session with the house was to try to present some of the challenges that we saw uh, within the con the confines of of this framework of the bill and um, have uh, worked to to address some of those things. The um, the house did make some of those changes. There are still some others that we would uh, we would like to see. I'm happy to walk through uh, our proposed changes um, in a moment. Um, but I want the final point that I want to make at the outset is that, uh, and this was a significant discussion point in the House as well, is the task that you are, are setting state government upon uh, solving climate change is a massive undertaking and one that we are not currently resourced to do. And as we think about this moment in time with where the budget is going, I, I, I want us all to be walking in with eyes wide open. Um, we are uh, we are going to be facing significant budget shortfalls, as you all know, and some of the things that we view as existing priorities are going to be difficult for us to accomplish, let alone a, a, a significant new uh, body of work. So that's not to say that we are not interested in doing that body of work. We obviously share the goals of trying to combat climate change. We just want to be uh, everybody to be eyes wide open. This is not. This process is, will not be. Will not come to. Okay. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, so have you? Uh, we all of us are learning how the federal dollars that are flowing to Vermont can and cannot be spent. Have you had an opportunity in the last month or whatever to to take a look at that and see if? Um, some of this work may actually uh, be supportable by federal dollars that are arriving. My my read, and, and that's based on on support provided by the Department of Finance and Management, is that no, this would not be eligible. It's not related to uh, a COVID-related re response, either from a public health or or sort of in, adapt, you know, in adapting to the changing economic circumstances and how we're responding there. Um, so it would not be an eligible cost. Obviously, there is some consideration being made in Congress now around uh, the potential for backfilling of state revenues, state and local revenues. Uh, to date, that has not gotten traction, and I'm not banking on that being a, a certain. Sure. OK. Um, yeah, I think it's many people's hope that um, federal dollars will support not just rebuilding precisely the economy we had prior to COVID, but that if there are opportunities, for instance, uh, this seems like it will go hand in glove with um, a clean energy economy, right? So perhaps there's an opportunity to for development that is, um, it may take someone out of an industry that suffered particularly under COVID, but provide them with employment in an, an emerging area. So I don't want to get us too far off, but I hope we're not that, 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 high. Yes, so Mr. Chair, I would say that that would likely come in some form of, not, not with some sort of private stimulus dollars, right? If we think about traditional federal stimulus in the midst of a recession, it's typically you know, sort of let's let's go build things and get people back to work and 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 that sort of function. There has been considerable more discussion around how do we how do we build what we want to see versus what we've what we've had, which is is some of what you're saying. And so um, that conversation is ongoing, and I know the congressional delegation is is thinking those things through, but um, it's sort of outside of our frame of of discussion for at least for this purpose. Okay, so so noted. There's a there's a price tag associated with doing this work. Certainly, there is. There's obviously economic benefits to be gained from doing this work. I, I think I, I want to separate out what doing this work means in the, the my definition. I'm thinking about as a, as the state agency put in charge of of doing the plan and or leading the planning process or helping to lead the process planning process and staffing things and doing the analysis 
and making sure we have that body of evidence that Luke described, um, that's not free, right? The, the, the transitions to a low carbon economy are obviously gonna come with different, a different set of costs uh, that will be borne by others and the state can contribute to those, but those are not, I'm talking about specifically, if we wanna have a good plan and we wanna have the, the, the right choices being made under funding, the, the process of developing the plan is, is, is penny wise and kind of foolish. Um, I, I don't want to interrupt the flow of your presentation. I'm hoping at some point we can do, or you can provide kind of a 30,000 foot look at like the architecture or bones of the bill, how it's set up, how it operates and how you look at it, whether those things are something you think makes sense and you support or something you'd like to make changes to before we get into the bill itself too. Thanks. Yeah, that's, 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 a, that's actually sort of generally where I w was going from there and then I'll, then I'll walk through some of the specific pieces of the bill. Um, from our perspective, the, uh, the intent of having a plan that leads to actions that then are held accountable uh, in some form, uh, there's, there's logic there. It's a question of what that looks like and what exactly is held to account. So from, from our perspective, the, the first task is the creation of the initial plan. Work should then flow from that plan if it has been authorized by the legislature um, and, and or funded by the legislature. And then, the, then it can be held to account from there. And so I make that distinction as a way to talk a bit about the legislative look back that you have been considering uh, the House discussed that idea as well, wanting to sort of have a uh, sort of thumbs up, thumbs down ratification of the plan. Uh, our proposal is actually a bit sort of in between that says you have granted us significant authority already. And if the uh, activities that the plan prescribes fall into those buckets where you have given us authority, then we should move forward with that. If there are instances where we do not have that authority, then it's logical for the legislature to weigh in at that point and say, go forth and do this per the plan, and then have the work flow from there. Um, the other big picture piece from my perspective is that in, a, in our way of thinking, we hold the plan accountable, because the plan is the sort of overarching balancing of effort um, to reach our climate change requirements, right? That's the overall goal. The rules are a subset of those, right? We may have rules that require certain things that lead to pollution reduction. We may have, as we're doing now, we may provide electric vehicle and other incentives. We may provide incentives for people to ride public transit. All of those things that are not rules in and of themselves, right? They're programs of state government <laughs> That are that achieve results in a different way. So there'll be a, they'll, we want this to be a sort of a basket of programs that are is going to drive activity across lots of different sectors. And this frankly builds on a bunch of the work that is already ongoing. Um, and so to hold just the rules, which are sort of narrow wedge of that pie, as the only things that are held accountable, we don't think it's appropriate. We think the, the entire you know, basket of a program should be held to account. And if it fails to meet the, the, ta the, the task of achieving those requirements, then the job should be to go back and look at the plan, see what's working, what's not, and make adjustments to the plan and then have all of those, those programs follow from that again. Um, and I understand that that is a, is a more cumbersome process, but it also allows us to make sure that we're seeing what's been effective and what's been cost effective and, and spread the need for more action across the full, the full spectrum rather than just on those things that are, are, are subject to rulemaking. Okay. Um, have you, well, it makes sense to me to, to be looking more broadly, for instance, although we, talk about efficiency Vermont, which is statutorily driven, right? Uh, and it's been, its goal was 
it has been kilowatt hour reductions. It's also delivered emission reductions because we've used less power that was fueled with fossil fuels to begin with. So it, to only look at the rules seems like we would be looking past or uh, it just seemed like a complicated task. How do you take all the programs already in operation and say, how would rules basically enhance them and expand them, I suppose. Um, have you, has the agency been looking at kind of inventorying or trying to assemble? It seems like there's an inventory that needs to happen where you, you look at all the tools you already have and say, where are we missing tools as part of this work? So that is, that is not something that we, that's something frankly we started to think about uh, pre-COVID as this bill was moving forward in the house, but we, you know, we've had to set a bunch of things aside for the time being. That, the, but you raise an excellent point, um, Senator, that 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 is actually the sort of precursor action by the council in our mind, is that council needs to review what we're doing now, what's effective, what's not, what needs to be ramped up, what needs to be, you know, retired, what needs to be changed in some way, all those all those good sort of analysis of previous programs that are spread across state government and to understand what the what the delta is what right what are we what is the difference between where we would be if we continued on the trend line we're on and where's the, the like where we want to be when um when we get to the requirements um and so that's the sort of piece in my mind that is is missing uh, from discussing with the House, I don't want to misrepresent them. They believe that that was a critical precursor. We just want to make it explicit. Um, so that's where that uh, that piece starts in my mind. Um, the the other I want to step back a little bit from um, from a structure of the council perspective, and we'll go through this a little bit in the language, but. Um, as I talked about a little bit before with the other states, council um, makes decision making a challenge. Um, and while having lots of perspectives is important, being able to get to a plan that's implementable is, 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 a, is a critical need. Um, and so from what we'll propose to you in, in language that you have is that the council be separated off from uh, an, an advisory uh, body, an advisory board that would provide that level of, of, of stakeholder involvement and participation and technical uh, knowledge that would inform the plan, but it would inform the, the council uh, who would be writing the plan. It's a, it's a slightly different way of thinking about it. It also, uh, we as the administration are accountable to you, right? Uh, the, the, the rest of the council isn't necessarily accountable to you in the same way. So our proposal is a, uh, is a smaller board made up of administrative, administration of, or executive branch officials uh, that would be required to come up with the plan and that would be supported by the the board. Okay. That's a quick question there. Um, so this committee did a lot of work on helping establish the Clean Water Board, and then there's a, a, there have been advisors to that board. But because it was an administrative responsibility to deliver on those programs, it remained a administrative board. Although they work with non administrative, uh, that work with an advisors off that board. Is that the kind of structure you're contemplating? Yes, I mean, I would, this is not intended to be a, the administration is gonna put forward a plan that has no stakeholder involvement and that's not that's not an effective model. That's not, that's gonna be this sort of go fast to go slow uh, challenge that has, that has, we've struggled with in lots of our, our climate change endeavors over the years. Um, what this does is create a, a body that is beholden to you through your, your accountability, your oversight of the executive branch um, to get that work accomplished. Um, and then there is the same where the same membership that the um, that would have been part of the original council that the house put together, we would simply propose to have them serve 
uh, in an advisory board capacity to inform that plan and make sure that it was appropriate to meet the needs of Vermonters, um, but that ultimately the buck would stop with um, the Secretary of Administration's chair and the other members of the, uh, the executive branch that would be uh, um, appointed to the board by the legislature. Right. So, so thank you. I, I want to ask Senator Campion a quick question because he served on the Act 250 uh, panel or board, um, but you also then had access to an advisory council sort of outside the board as you worked and dug into certain areas. Was that a useful structure for the Act 250 Commission? Yeah, I think it was an essential structure. Um, yeah, very useful. Okay. Um, and Mr. Commissioner, just on a time check, so we're at 11. I'm figuring we have roughly 40 more minutes for your presentation, assuming that mm -hmm. Representative Brigland gets here. Uh, so I'm just, for all our pacing, I just want to mention that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I think it makes sense at this point to, to go into the, the bill, the, our proposed changes to the bill, if that uh, would be appropriate uh, at this point. And I'm happy to share my screen uh, to do that. Great. Uh, let me make sure that I do that effectively. All right. Can everybody see? Nope. Oh, wait. Sorry. Try to, try to bring it to the problem with multiple computer screens is that Zoom can't quite handle moving it around. So as, as I'm looking at my screen, my camera is actually over here. I promise I am uh, focused on our conversation, but it's just hard to yeah. do that when things are 90 degrees out. All right. Well, it looks good here. We can see the, okay. the, the uh, text. Um, I am going to blast through sections one through three of the bill because we do not propose any changes. Um, the legislative findings in section two uh, we feel are appropriate. Um, they're based largely, frankly, on the work that we have done um, within the agency and department to try to, uh, to measure and address the impacts of climate change. Um, the, the change from goals to requirements and the specific numbers associated with it, we don't propose any changes. Um, so then we get into section four, which is um, really where the, the bulk of the changes we propose are well the bulk of the of the language of the bill as well. So I'll I'll walk through that. Um, I'll try not to to get too deep into the into the specific verbiage in the interest of time. But if if there are questions from the committee, I would prefer to stop and answer them now um, so that we don't get um, there aren't isn't any confusion moving forward. Um, Couple of things, uh, and this will become clearer later. First change is to propose uh, a definition of what the council is. Um, one of the, the struggles that we had just in terms of the logical flow of the bill was that it, it kind of uh, lumped the tasks of the council and of the plan together. And sometimes that, since the council is responsible for the plan, there's, you know, that you can see why they would be similar in nature. We thought it was really important to lay out the clear responsibilities of the council versus what the plan shall do. Um, and so just provide some recommendations in terms of clarity there. And again, provide a, a definition of, of, of what the plan is relative um, to this point. Um, so this is where uh, the, the, that change that I discussed in terms of the council membership comes up. We had worked with uh, House Energy and Technology to put the Secretary of Administration on the panel as well and make uh, him or her the, the chair of the council. Uh, this is similar to the way the Clean Water Board uh, works, which is an effective model in that uh, the Secretary of Administration is first among equals, has some ability to uh, to uh, lead to to the decisions where where disagreements between the various agencies might exist. Um, and then here's the major change: rather than having um, those the membership that follows that's appointed by the 
by the speaker and by the committee on committees, the uh, those people are moved to the uh, appointed in the same way, but on to an advisory board that supports the council. Uh, Commissioner, may I just ask a quick question? Yep. Uh, did you, these uh, proposals, did you already propose them to the House or are these, uh, would you remind me, are these uh, new to us? We we did propose them to the House. There is a previous version of these proposals that is in PDF form uh, yes, that, that's that's on the House uh, yeah. Energy Technology mm -hmm. website. What uh, I asked uh, Ms. O'Toole to do and what she's done is to bring those changes up to date for the purposes of the bill that passed the House. Um, so since they are slightly different and we'd all get confused as to what was in and what was out. So thank you. These 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 changes have been proposed previously uh, before it before it left committee in the House. Great. Thanks. Okay. Thank you for that question, though. Uh, um, this is mostly about moving things around, but this is the provides a purpose statement for the council. Um, it also creates a specific requirement for the council, very similar to what the Clean Water Board uh, does, and it actually uh, is based upon language that that's in the uh, statutes uh, creating the Clean Water Board that uh, that has the. Uh, council recommend to the Secretary of Administration the appropriate allocations of fund for the purposes of developing the state budget required to to implement the plan effectively. So the one piece that is that is not often discussed in this uh, in this construct is what are the not you know what are the the budgetary tools we need in order to address these changes. If we use the clean water example. There are certain regulatory changes we've made over time, but there are also uh, grant programs and other project programs to, to get uh, uh, clean water projects on the ground so that we can uh, see those, those changes faster than they might occur through a regulatory fashion. Um, and so- I have a quick question on, if you write on this section, it's just slipping off the top of the page here. It says, it is the purpose of the council to perform the following. And I'm, this it might sound like a semantic question, but I just really do want to understand if there's something you're distinguishing here. Uh, another way of saying it might have been the council shall, and then it would just list each of these things, adopt, recommend, et cetera, review. Um, so I don't, that it is the purpose of, I don't know if you're creating a, a little bit of a distance between the council and the things that follow, or it's just semantics. So let me. I think uh, you, uh, it, it is probably a, a semantics piece. I think it'll become, the distinction frankly becomes clearer in the articulation of what the plan shall include. Um, the council is given this entire charge in the existing language in the bill, or given a charge in the bill that includes what we sh we think should be attributed to the plan. If if that makes sense, I think. What if if you'll hang with me through yeah. that point, and then we'll revisit this question. Great. Um, so that this section, section two here talks about, or section two talks about the great recommendation of a budget. Um, sub three talks about periodically reviewing the implementation of the plan to make sure that the implementation is going effectively. Um, we are supposed to be looking at the, you know, sort of reviewing the measures that are in place to, to make sure that we're achieving those reductions. Um, the um, sub five talks about providing resources to municipalities and state agencies uh, fought for resiliency and adaptation and achieving the greenhouse gas mitigation requirements. Um, sub six goes into um, sort of whether or not adjustments are needed to the plan, right? In an ideal world, you have a council that is constantly um, making adjustments to the plan so that we don't have to wait until 2025 and 2030 and 2050 to know 
it hasn't been effective. Um, right, we need to make modifications as we go in order to stay on that trajectory. Um, and then this, what's struck here is effectively what was in, in the plan before. And pardon the noise behind me, there are teenagers leaving the house. Um, so I'm gonna skip down to where we begin. Um, the next piece, and this is something that, uh, was um, uh, open discussion in the in the house ultimately they determined not to, but we think subcommittees are are really important and the specific topics that these uh, subcommittees would address are really important. Um, it's a question of how we get to it and whether or not a specific subcommittee is needed or if it's a another way of addressing uh, the concerns raised. Um, and so we we recommend that that be a, a may so that it's a permissive environment where we can uh, where we can get that input as needed but if it's a formal subcommittee or not or a, a different process altogether um the this flows in part because as you change the council to be a council with an advisory board the the pool of bodies for subcommittees changes as well um, and so we just wanna make sure that we're not sort of limiting ourselves to the council and advisory board where there are lots of other voices in, in, the, in, the, in various interests within these uh, different subcommittees that may exist. So um, are you, you're saying, let me make sure I understand. I, I get the whole structural and committee management organization mm -hmm. concern. But for the the council subcommittees named rural resilience and adaptation, for instance, are you saying that you think the four that are named are topics that you want to address? It's just not you're not sure that you want to address them through naming a formal subcommittee. You right. want to cover the cover the same territory but cover it differently. Right. Okay. Right. Obviously, thinking about rural resilience and adaptation is incredibly important. Thinking about um, how we look at cross-sector opportunities is incredibly important. How do we look at making sure that the transitions for all Vermonters are done in a just way, an equitable way? Uh, those are factors that we want to consider. There's obviously significant uh, advantages that we have as, as our from our natural and working lands and can we leverage those can we figure out how to support uh, those those sectors of our economy to make sure that they that they both can be contributors to our fiber climate change and adapt as well um, so there are a number of factors at play um, can I, I know we're under time pressure. Let me ask just a quick question. Are you already set up as an administration to work across all agencies on this? Uh, we have, we have, a, have had a number of, of efforts over time. Um, so standing this up in a meaningful way would not be a, a difficult challenge in my mind. There are um, from the in the previous administration of the climate cabinet that would then went to the climate action commission that that i chaired along with paul costello early in the administration to we now have a interagency uh climate and energy working group um that that continues to discuss implementation of some of those recommendations and other topics as they come up the the sharing of knowledge and implementation is is alive and well uh just not in this form Okay, thank you. And the other, the other piece that it provides is a clear sort of uh, organizational structure and management of that information. Right now, it's a collaborative sharing environment, which is important, but there's not sort of a, there's less of that sort of who's in charge and how we, how are we tracking all this data, which I think is there's relevance to this, this work for sure. I'm going to keep scrolling down as there are no changes on these pages. All right, uh, so this this is where we um, where we bring some of the original charge from the council down to uh, the specifics of the plan. And so the plan really uh, is the is complete, and we think 
that that's important um, in part because the um, cause of action section that we're going to recommend holds the plan accountable. Um, and so that the, pl the plan, which is the full suite of, of, of programs as we talked about, is held to account and the state as a whole is held to account for that plan. And if the plan is inadequate or uh, then, then the cause of action would kick in rather than simply one section of that as we talked about with the rules. So being very clear as to what's required in the plan it, or, is, is important. Okay. Um, quick check in on dates. Does December 1, 21 um, in your assessment provide the, um, the structure you're talking about, board plus advisory uh, council to an, enough time to write a plan? Um, I believe, and and Megan may be able to correct me, but I believe that change was already made at our request in the house I'm sorry, it's been a few months and a lot has happened, but I'm pretty sure that that change was made. Maybe Luke can uh, previously in the house, the original timeline was significantly faster. Uh, and I think this is a more reasonable time to do that work. We're talking about a significant reduction in emissions across all sectors of our economy that's gonna need public input and, uh, and effort into the plan. And so to do it right would take a, a longer chunk of time than was originally uh, proposed as the as the bill is introduced. Okay, that's 520 days between now and then. Doesn't include the days that have taken place since the legislature met in January. Okay, thank you, Senator McDowell. Um, so. And then, and then what we also do is set very clear timelines um, for when the plan would need to be updated beyond the sort of every four years uh, that's anticipated. That essentially saying if the if we have an in, in a greenhouse gas inventory that comes out that shows that um, we have failed to meet the requirements then that plan must immediately be updated and be completed within a 12 month time period. Is that the um, one that ends in 2024? No, so that's so in, is, in, if you look at my screen now, the, the we've added the language that I'm gonna highlight. Do you see that? Yep. That's, that says that within 12 months of the publication of an inventory compiled, that's showing the state has failed to meet a requirement, right? So if we, if 2025 rolled around and the data, obviously, as you know, has a lag associated with it, but if when the data is complete and it shows that we didn't make it, then we immediately get to work updating the plan and making sure that we can address that, that difference between where we hope to be and where we are so that for the next milestone, we can continue to make progress and hit that, that requirement. So it is a immediate trigger um, so that we, so, so essentially saying for the, the purposes of the cause of action later on, we, we, can, we are as a sort of self accountability mechanism, right? To say that we recognize we didn't make it, we need to get to work. So there's no question about we need to wait for litigation to play out. The state is immediately start to work to update that. Um, a quick question on these triggers, whether it's for getting yourself, you know, giddy up, or if it's a cause of action being brought. Um, the first milestone expressed in the bill is 2025, and our, our uh, GHG data lags by two to three years. Mm -hmm. So our, from a sort of a legal point of view or are, are we going to need to wait till roughly 2027 or 2028 to have a test as to whether or not we're uh, meeting the goals of the, the bill? I mean, I know you could say uh, we could model and we could, we could look at a trajectory, but because they're expressed as hard targets, are we going to legally be sort of held uh, 
uh, we won't be able to take action until that data is delivered and that might not be till 2027, 2028. Uh, it's more of a sort of a theory of action question, right? It, the state can take action at any point based on the data that it has to update the plan and make changes. And if we, if in 2026, we see the 20, 2023 or 2024 data is not trending in the direction we're anticipating, then we can make adjustments then. If you're talking about a legal recourse, then yes, everything hinges upon that inventory being complete. Okay. Um, so uh, the other piece that I will say is that our, our overall greenhouse gas inventory data lags two to three years. That is correct. But we have some pieces of information that allow us that are, that are complete and accurate uh, and in a much more timely fashion. We just can't do the whole whole thing, so we can see trends where it's going. And if you'll if you take a look, and I can share the uh, share the uh, link with with Jude if you'd like the um, our our current inventory, which is complete as of 2020, 2016, is has projections out for for what we think 27 and 2018 the final inventories will be from the data that we have and some reasonable and, uh, assumptions. Sure, um, great. I, I don't want to say get too far into it. I just wanted to check that big picture impression. Um, and if, yes, please, if you could share that with me, we'll put it up on the website for committee's use later or interested others who are following the meeting. Thanks. Yep, I will I will send that along. I, I think that's that's an important this is new as of this year, and I think it's an important tool for, it's not necessarily fully forecasting because it's some real hard data, but it does, given the full lag in getting an inventory out, it's important to have as much information as we can. So I will, I'll send that to, to Jude for the committee's use. Um, so I'm gonna, I wanna anchor right here on, on sub two here. This is really where we talk about being very clear about what are the existing programs that exist and are they effective um, so that we can, um, can understand where we stand at this point. Um, I, in testimony in front of the house, um, we talked about sort of how close we thought we were going to come to the 2025 uh, goal, or sorry, requirement. Um, the, the question has, the, that, at that point, uh, based on the sort of modeling we've done as part of the state's consideration of TCI, Transportation and Climate Initiative, we had some sense of where we thought the kind of business as usual case was going in terms of uh, transportation fuel use and could kind of then extrapolate out what projections would look like into the future. So we did a five year and a 10 year, so 2021 and 2026. Uh, those are mostly directional in nature. Um, the transportation, and, and by the 2026 number, we were sort of at 22% reduction, I think, from um, 2005 levels. So a, a year late and three percentage points short, but in the, in the window of uncertainty. Um, the challenge I think that we're, we're facing is that there, there's, as the world has changed, um, the underlying assumptions that that data, the TCI data came from have changed as well. So they were based on the impression that it, it likely wasn't going to be uh, the, excuse me, that the, the clean car standards weren't going to be rolled back and that, um, that the price of fuel was going to continue to sort of stay where it was and glad, gradually increase. Um, and we, we, we looked at sort of what what might happen if um, we didn't, if the, the clean car standards were rolled back and gas prices say dropped to $1.50 as a sort of worst case scenario. Um, the, obviously they're still in litigation, but the clean car standards uh, have been rolled back and gas is 
as of this as of yesterday in, in Burlington was $1.59. Um, and so these things that we didn't anticipate occurring have occurred. And we're also in the middle of a global pandemic. And so a lot of the sort of assumptions that were made are somewhat in flux. I just wanted to anchor on that point because that was something that's been come up. And it's like, how close are we at, at getting to that based on what we're doing now? And so I just thought it was useful for that context. But I will, I will keep moving in the interest of time. Um, so in looking at that analysis, we want to look at how effective the strategy has been at, being, at reducing greenhouse gas emissions or promoting resiliency, um, whether or not that strategy or program unfairly burdens uh, a specific group uh, within uh, Vermont, um, whether it, it furthers our state planning goals, um, whether any co-benefits of the strategy are promoting other state goals. You know, if we think about something like public transit, which has potential for greenhouse gas emissions reductions, it's actually typically a co-benefit of our providing access to transportation for all Vermonters. Um, so that, that sort of the relationship there isn't one-to-one. -one. Um, uh, look at whether or not a strategy increases toxic air contaminants or criteria air pollutants. Um, and so then, and then making uh, potential recommendations to modify those programs. Um, and then in that instance where uh, uh, we, um, we make modifications if there is an instance where the, the state does not have the, the executive agencies do not have the existing authority, then we would look to come back to you to, to seek that authority. Um, and then this is where we get into it within the plan, sort of what happens if all the existing strategies fail or fail to meet the requirements. And that's, that's the state we're in now. If we, if we were on the right trajectory, we wouldn't need to be having this conversation. Um, so we need to make sure that we're continuing to make more progress. Um, and so then you, again, you look at the same number of same sort of prioritization factors uh, that, we, that I talked about previously in existing programs. Um, and this again comes back to if if we if we lack the authority to do something, uh, you grant us that authority, as as Luke mentioned, right? You have to give us explicit authority to do rulemaking or other things. We don't have that inherent authority if we lack that authority specifically, then we come back to you for implementation of that program. Um, and that will matter as we talk in a moment about the timelines that we present as being related to, to this work. And so um, if you'll just hold your questions for now, um, again, going through some priorities, I think this is largely existing language moved around um, and I'm not gonna anchor here because um, we've obviously got lots of, of priorities uh, within this work to make sure that we're accounting for all communities in Vermont and not leaving anybody behind. Um, and then the uh, section five talks about um, how to make sure that we're accurately measuring uh, and, and hopefully in a timely manner um, our greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And then um, evaluation of the total costs to implement the plan. Um, one of the factors we haven't discussed, which is a critical one, uh, there is, and then we sort of mentioned it earlier, but not in terms of cost, there are actions that are going to be need to be taken now that will help make our communities more resilient in the face of climate change. And there are actions that are gonna need to be taken now to make sure in the long run, we are less impacted overall by climate change. And there is a cost to both of those. And there is some sort of balance uh, between the two of them that needs to be sorted through. Um, in the first round of the plan, the, the goal would be to come up with a sort of five-year spending plan, uh, not just the single budget that the council would be responsible for. You know, thinking about if you know, we we may want to eventually get to the point where we're doing X, Y, or Z. It's going to take a year or so to ramp that up, and therefore we don't need significant funding in the first year, but we would need it in years two, three, two, three, four, and five. 
five, whatever that might be. Um, and that would, so that would include looking at all the, all the different ways in which we might use the state purse to support uh, communities and individuals as they look to transition to different forms of energy. Um, this is one thing that uh, that number nine was it was in the previous bill, but basically thinking about a municipal vulnerability index, trying to think about how vulnerable a community is to climate change, um, and uh, that was something that Representative Sebelia in the in the House was very interested in, in working on, um, and having the Department of Health, I believe, play a significant role in that process. Um, and then the nine, so 10 through uh, 12 is really about the tools that uh, municipalities need in order to be successful and be supportive of, of these goals, these requirements. Um, and then just 13 is really about thinking about uh, is there should, should we think about, should, as we've gone through a process to develop a plan, should we be thinking about whether or not we are organized in the most effective way possible? Uh, we may come back to you and say, there needs to be additional members on the advisory board. Uh, this worked, this didn't. Here are some uh, things that we think are necessary to move, to really advance this forward, whatever that might be. So I think it's just important to sort of call out that, that moment of self-reflection. Uh, so again, these are things that were that we've reorganized um, from the plan. So I'm going to just skip through those. Um, obviously, you're going to have significant more more testimony on a lot of these issues, and we're happy to engage in that process as we go along. But in the interest of time, I want to move forward. Um, so section 593, we amend to say rather than saying rules, we Call it say implementation, um, because what we what in our in our envisioning of this process, the plan again is held accountable. What is in the plan, how we implement the plan, and whether or not that's effective, right? So the first instance is did we did we come up with the right tools uh, to address the need, and the second is did we implement them effectively? And so rather than focus just on the rules. We talked about the implementation fully. And this is really important. There are three buckets within each for each that we put strategies in. The first bucket is those we have existing authority to do and don't require any rules. That's actually the second bucket in those lists. So I'll sorry. First bucket is we have existing authority and we need to do rulemaking. So that that's bucket one here. The second is we have existing authority and it doesn't require rulemaking, might be some sort of uh, other pro voluntary program or something that we would do where, where rules weren't required, right? It may be an adjustment to prioritization of focus of an existing program, whatever that might be. We, so we talk about December 1st, 2021, I believe as the, as the, as the day of the plan, this, said that we would get um, rulemaking done by December 1, 2023. And if it didn't need rules, July 1, 2023. And then the bucket that it leaves out, which is the frankly the most critical one, um, is, is that those instances of policy where we think action is appropriate, but you have not granted us that authority. And that, that's really the, the rub in the legislative look back, um, as we've talked about, is, uh, is, is that if we don't have the authority, and this came up a little bit in the House, was that if we don't have the authority to move forward with a program, then it's difficult to hold us accountable for not having moved forward with that program. Um, and so our proposal is essentially that those are the instances, as we described earlier, where we would bring that to you and say, we need this in order to be able to meet the, the confines of the plan. Please grant us that authority. 
And then once that authority was granted, we would go forward and implement it. Um, so. Um, and then every time that we update the plan, then there's a timeline, a specific timeline that we propose for any anything that follows, right? So it's an 18 month time making timeline for rulemaking and a 12 month timeline for non rulemaking activities. So essentially saying every time we go back and make an adjustment to the plan, there's another timeline that the public can then hold state agencies accountable, uh, or the state as a whole accountable to that timeline. If that makes sense. It'll be clear as we get to the um, cause of action thing. Um, just to, sorry to interrupt. Um, Jude, if um, Representative Briglin arrives, can you uh, call that out to, to, the, to me? Uh, otherwise, let's keep on going with the uh, commissioner because we're closing in on the end here. We are. All right, so again, this is moving largely moving some things around, getting to the same sort of general intent, but framed uh, in the way we think is appropriate to frame. Um, so we'll, we'll cruise through these. Um, so getting now to the cause of action section. Perfect, well-timed. Um, the, this is I think where the changes that we propose have the most impact on ensuring that the state is doing the work that you are telling the state to do, right? Um, in the current cause of action and the available remedies that Luke went through now, uh, they're primarily explicitly related to things that you've told us to do typically through a rulemaking process. Um, as we've talked about, there are our current list of strategies and any more we might develop are all, are very few of them, frankly, are actually rules. Um, most of them are, are incentive structures or other things that we're, you know, sort of adopting to, to get people to be able to afford to make transitions to uh, lower carbon alternatives. So, when we think about that, we want to think about the, the plan as a whole, because let's let's provide an instance where this gets challenged. It gets to 2025, and we uh, uh, look, we get challenged, and or it gets to the time period after that when we realize that we didn't make it, and we get challenged. The first look should be at where are we now and what's different and what's become cost effective that wasn't previously. And what has turned out to not be the most effective strategy so that we can go back and look at the whole thing rather than saying just because this strategy wasn't effective doesn't mean we want to we want to dial down the requirements right to say we need we need people to emit more from this sector when it turns out we could get all of the work done from another sector much more easily and cost effectively uh, as a balancing point right and just that if you're just saying that the rule needs to, the specific rule needs to be adjusted, um, then that, uh, that to me doesn't give us the opportunity to, to do a effective cost effectiveness analysis. That, That's for 2025. So that th this would be for all, um, so this, this is for all of the milestones. That's about 2,900 days. <laughs> Thank you, Senator McDonald. Um, always try and keep, keep it measured against World War II, which is 1,336 start to finish, not 1,336 st start to finish plan, but 1,336 to start and get to the end of the war. Well, then I'd, I'd like to consider that we look back to where we've been over the last 30 years of knowing that climate change was a challenge and not taking significant sufficient action. To um, so, Mr. Chair, um, yes. I got called yesterday by a, um, a radio station that wanted my opinion on whether or not we should postpone action on this bill 
because of the COVID-19. Um, and um, said, should we, the question was, should we still be working on this bill? And my answer was no, we should not still be working on this bill. We should have done it 20 years ago. Um, so my and we're being asked here. today because of COVID-19, why we're not postponing action on this bill to, um, and that's what happens. And the bill that we have before us was, um, Oh, 1,200, 1,300 days to get to a rule that was in place that had been re reviewed. And now we're looking at one that close to doubles that. So um, I'm, I, I'm not faulting the witness in any way, but we keep finding reasons not to deal with this in a timely fashion. Thank you. So, so I'm just, I'm dealing within the construct of the bill that's been proposed. What is missing in here, frankly, as and as the sort of the the reason why there's been a discussion about having some sort of legislative look back, is there is an absence of specific policy recommendation policy decisions from the legislature, uh, and that this is an effort to think holistically so all of those potential solutions can be considered together. And if if this is the approach, then then let let me provide testimony relative to the approach rather than- okay, this, yeah, this is a holistic approach that takes a, quite some time. And, um, and that's, right. that's what's being proposed. And, right. and, and I, I would add, we've earned some, learned some interesting things today about you know, what the basis of gas mileage and automobile standards and et cetera, et cetera, that, that you've shared, that, that the witnesses shared with us, which all of which have um, sort of set back any climate actions just by their nature. At the same time, we're considering extending the time to deal with climate issues. And so I, I, if, Senator, if I could, if I could uh, finish the thought that I didn't make earlier, if that would be helpful, is that I often get asked, is this the right time to take action in the transportation sector, right? Our emissions are, are way down, gas prices are cheap, this is the right time to look at things. Well, if we look at it, one, yes, our emissions overall from during this period of time, because we're not been driving around and going to work and running errands and doing all those things are way down. At the same time, if we look at the lines of Vermonters who are lined up to get food, right? The, Purchasing power of Vermonters right now is at an all-time low, and so I, you know, I just I I, I want to make sure that those factors are all in place. It's not about simply about the tr long-term trajectory of emissions are are bleak based on the price of gas and and clean car standards. It's a mix of factors mm -hmm. that make predicting the future are incredibly difficult. Apparently, so is setting goals and timelines. Uh, no, nobody, I don't think anybody's actually arguing over whether the, the timelines and the requirements in here are appropriate. Yeah, no. Senator Bray, I have a hard stop at 12. Yep, okay, so let's press on. Uh, the House is still on the floor, so I don't think we're gonna see Representative Briglin. Let's, let's keep uh, okay. cranking along for the finish line here, thank you. So um, in the cause of action, we hold both the plan and any rule uh, that was required as a part of the plan. And if we think about the timelines that we laid out for you in terms of 18 months after the original plan, 18 months after any subsequent uh, update to the plan, if those timelines aren't made, then there would be a specific cause of action. So if the plan's not done in the timelines, that are laid out either in the initial timeline or in an instance where a plan update is required. If that's not done in a timely fashion, then uh, those, those that cause of action still exists. So it's um, just making sort of clear how the logic flows from the plan to programs um, or rules, whatever they might be, to then a cause of action holding them to account. Um, this is important. The reason why we have changed this from the Secretary of Natural Resources to the Attorney General is that while we as the 
state agency primarily responsible for sort of managing climate change activities, our authority is not all exclusively going to be used as we look at programmatic pieces, right? There, there are things that might be in the agency of transportation's world or the public service department's world that would not be activities that we would undertake. So holding the, again, stepping back to this is a one state, one effort, holding the state accountable and the having the attorney general as, as the state's attorney uh, providing that, that oversight. Um, so moving on to, uh, to the next cause of action. Um, sorry, I just got a little bit lost. Um, essentially that the thinking about whether or not the, the plan itself is adequate. Um, that's what we get at here, right? Any action that talks about whether it's adequate. So that's really thinking about whether or not the work that has been prescribed as part of the plan rather than the rules again are sufficient. Um, that's, that's what that means. Again, um, thinking about the, the plan rather than the rules. Um, and then the, 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 what stepping back to the plan um, is we don't need to talk about a substantial cause of failure because we're not talking about a subset of the plan of the plan anymore. And so three here essentially says that if the if the plan was adopted and was the cause of the fit sheet states a failure to meet the the requirements as laid out, then there would be a cause of action um, available to uh, the uh, to plaintiffs that would then require us to go back and amend the plan and develop additional programs that actually, or different programs that actually uh, meet the requirements. Okay. Um, and so that's, again, it's sort of just the logical flow of how the work would naturally occur and make sure that we can balance factors as they change to make sure that we have the most effective and most cost-effective and most equitable strategy. So the expansion, uh, in a way, from rules to plan means that it, you're, any aspect of it, including the rules, could be quote unquote at fault. But um, do you want to make sure that the totality of the program uh, is sort of quote unquote held responsible? So at, right. and, and you're calling that, that totality is the plan. Right. Okay, got it, thanks. So that's, yeah, that's, that's a great way to think about it. Let's think about the, the totality of, uh, of programs that we would, we're going to need and to make sure that the, as a whole, they are evaluated rather than on an individual basis um, to determine whether they're the substantial cause of failure. Um, so um, would this then sweep up something like, we have weatherization goals. I don't know that they're hard targets the way this bill is proposing, but could someone under this, as you read it now, say, you know, we, we failed to weatherize 80,000 homes and that's, that's actually one of our major sources of emissions in the thermal sector is, you know, burning fossil fuels to heat homes. So, um, why didn't the state, you know, someone would bring action in a way to challenge our, the level at which we executed there. Is that permitted in this language or would that be excluded? So it, I don't think that it, would, it wouldn't be a part of it because unless, unless we incorporated that specific goal as part of the plan, it would not be held to account. What I guess what I would say is is we're missing a couple of steps along the way. Yep. If, as we're developing the plan, we recognize that the, the tools we have in place to meet that 80,000 uh, target, or frankly, whatever target is actually needed to get to those to that part of the, the requirement, then, then we, if we would augment the existing tools with new ones 
And if those tools were insufficient to meet the, the, the requirement, then that would, all of them would be held to account. So it, it wouldn't be the goal necessarily of 80,000 homes, which frankly is, was based on sort of a best estimate at the time, but may not be relevant currently. Um, sure. They wouldn't hold that goal specifically to account. Okay, thank you. Um, it's we think, sorry, the, yeah. the finished up thought. It's making me think that things that we would like to see executed, one way to get them into this paradigm is to make them, and I'm not sure how, exactly how it happens, officially part of the plan, right? Uh, Don't have a plan. Well, sure. I, I would say that the, that uh, not to step outside, fully outside the realm of this, the bill in this discussion, but if that would be if, if the, if the legislature's intent is to set a specific policy outcome, then you should pass <laughs> that specific policy, and then we right, would incorpor right. incorporate that as an existing right, strategy right. that we would consider. That's right, right. Convert a goal to a, a hard target, and then it can, becomes part of the plan. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, I mean, we would incorporate, so I, I, we would, in depends, I, I don't think we would incorporate the 80,000 home reference into the plan. What we would incorporate is the expected emissions reductions from I those 80,000 homes. Yeah. The, the, and, and frankly, that still doesn't give us the, the actual strategies to get us to that reduction. Um, and, you know, just, it's a good way to think about co-benefits as well. We do a lot of our weatherization work simply to, for public health and low income, you know, public safety reasons rather than fully in reducing emissions, right? It's a cost, cost savings issues for our, our most vulnerable population. Uh, many times the emissions reductions that we see aren't as strong as we'd hoped because people are simply able to have the temperature in their home be more livable um, and so, and, and be able to afford that. So there's, there's a balancing point there. What I would wanna to look to is the outcomes we're trying to achieve, which are emissions reductions, and how do we get to those? Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then following, we propose uh, striking um, any uh, attorney's fees associated with these actions. We don't think that's appropriate. Uh, because it would become burdensome to the state in terms of cost? We, uh, it's my impression that we don't do this in other contexts. Um, I'm not sure why it should be different here. Okay. We'll leave that one alone for now. <laughs> Keep going. All right. Um, no major changes here. We're going to get down to uh, yes, this rather important section nine down at the bottom, which anchors, which brings us back to the, the where I started early on, which is as you've as we've laid it out, this is a pretty significant body of work just in developing the plan to make sure that we then have the tools to move forward. Obviously, we need to have a sort of separate discussion once the plan is done about fully funding the tools and making sure that that works. But just to do the plan in and of itself is going to call, is going to require significant resources. Uh, we, we've spoken to many states around the region um, about what it takes to implement their work. Uh, there are some that are doing it where they basically just reallocated somebody's existing job duties and said, you're not gonna do those. Uh, that is not the approach that we necessarily recommend taking. Um, but you know, it's, Massachusetts has within their Department of uh, Environmental Protection and with their in their Secretariat on Energy and Environmental Affairs has you know a, a dozen or more uh, people working on this topic. Um, and while it, Massachusetts is obviously a larger state from a population perspective the issues themselves and the technical uh, uh, knowledge needed don't necessarily downscale to a similar percentage of the population for Vermont. Um, 
That said, obviously they're not, you know, even in even in normal budget times, adding significant resources to the state budget is 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 a difficult task. And so what was arrived at here was the creation of three new limited service positions of agency in order to, to support the, the planning development work and then um, associated costs with them along with you know, the, the detailed modeling and economic forecasting and cost effectiveness analysis that you want as part of the uh, record associated with the plan and the actions taken uh, to fund that effort. Um, I am not at this point speaking for the administration in terms of whether or not we think this is an appropriate amount of money and appropriate to go through at this time. I'm just flagging where we were and how this uh, in conversation in February was a significantly different conversation than we are having now as we think about a, you know, even the sort of 2% reduction scenario that's been proposed for a skinny first quarter budget, that's a 2% reduction from FY20 enacted do dollars, which is not where FY2021 uh, proposed was and where it had gotten to in the house before uh, things changed. And so that is, you know, so we're gonna need to be working with you to be making some difficult decisions about where we prioritize existing resources. Um, and so while this, this challenge to Senator McDonald's point needs to, be, uh, needs to be addressed and we should have been on it 20 years ago, the, there, there is only so much work that I can, that I can uh, have our staff do with the available resources we have. Can I uh, double check on the, that 2%? So my understanding is it's actually an 8% cut at an annual uh, sure. yes. perspective, yeah. right? And because we're only talking about a quarter, we're talking about 2% in terms of dollars, but right. uh, sort of depth, depth of cut is 8%. And for us, if you and so so I, we've done the math, and I need to lock this down. But I think the eight percent really is closer to fifteen percent of what we proposed for FY twenty one. Because so, twenty one was going to be an increase over twenty. Right. Okay. All right. So great. Well, uh, you've. You've left us on a, the screen has left us on a moment of suspense. It just says effective date. What is the effective date? <laughs> that, that we do not propose to change. <laughs> okay. To, to Senator McDonald's point, we need to get to work. <laughs> okay. Um, well, great. It is 11.58. So thanks for a uh, marathon discussion walkthrough. Thank you very much. Uh, it was very helpful to, uh, very. to hear what uh, to hear the administration's thoughts on all this. So, committee, thank you, everyone. Um, we'll reschedule Representative Brigland, and tomorrow we're off and running. Uh, tomorrow and Friday, with uh, 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 five witnesses a day, I think we should learn a lot more, um, and um, it'll be interesting to explore the questions we've been raising so far with our the witnesses coming in. So thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. Have a great day. Thank you very much. I appreciate you giving me the time. Sorry I went over my allotted time, but I think it's an important conversation that we get right at it. So great. Yeah, it's a it's a complicated conversation. So I'm glad we got into it in the depth we did. And I'm sure we'll have more discussion and questions to come. <laughs> I have no doubt. Yeah, we'll do our best not to disappoint. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Thank you.